autism, the Tuskegee study, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, our experience is diverse. The latter, however, is something that has caused many issues in our health, well-being, and longevity. This evening, we want to empower students and attendees to become better advocates for and increase the agency of Black individuals in receiving health services. We will, we will begin with the panelists introducing themselves, then move into a panel discussion and end with question and answer. If you have questions throughout the discussion, please feel free to use the chat and we'll monitor it. So for my panelists, um, please introduce yourself, um, name and organization. And we will start with Dr. Hines. I wasn't sure if I was first or not. Hi, everyone. I'm looking forward to a lively conversation. My name is Anika Hines. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Policy at the BCU School of Medicine, um, where I do work on chronic stress experiences of African Americans as a mechanism underlying racial and ethnic disparities and chronic diseases, specifically cardiovascular diseases. Um, but I also do some work with psychological disorders, um, most uh, mood, mood disorders, uh, depression, and anxiety. Um, so should I give my five minutes right now or we'll, that a we'll do the introductions and we'll go into that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Um, Dr. Kidd. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Kidd. I am the owner of Kidd Wellness Solutions and Consulting, uh, which is a virtual online therapy practice and also boutique sport mental health consulting company. So um, it's really, really uh, exciting time in my life. I've uh, been able to uh, really kind of build out some of the things, the vision that I have for my career. And, and right now, what I focus on, I see a lot of athletes in private practice. I see particularly first responders, athletes, and primarily members of the Black community. Uh, since the pandemic has started, my Black female clientele has driven through the roof. So I'm really proud to say that I've been able to serve some, some of our ladies and, and our community. Uh, so I do that type of work. I do some trauma work in regards to uh, all types of trauma, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, interpersonal violence, uh, trauma. So gun violence. I've worked with some gun survivors as well, gunshot survivors. Most recently, I started a wonderful relationship with the NBA where I provide them a lead consultant with the NBA, providing uh, mental health uh, uh, programming and, and assisting them with some of their mental health initiatives. And um, a little interesting fact about me, I went to school, right? I played college football right down the way in Petersburg, Virginia. And I, uh, I also pinch hit at the VCU School of Social Work as an adjunct professor. People don't, don't really know that. I haven't taught in a couple of years, but hopefully next year they call me so I can teach a course. But I'm glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. You're very busy. <laughs> He's so very busy. <laughs> All of you all are. Um, and the future, uh, Dr. Sharonica Barcliffe. <laughs> Perhaps, yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sharonica Barcliffe. I am the CEO and founder of the Barcliffe Group Incorporated. We are proud to be a woman and minority owned healthcare and management consultancy. We are, yes, right there. Yeah. <laughs> we are headquartered in Atlanta, but we have a national footprint. Uh, we are very much interested in healthcare equality, both on the corporate, the organization, and the community level. So we like to bridge that, have that bridge from the practitioner to the patient to the healthcare organization to make sure that we are a fluid a healthcare energy system. Uh, I will highest to be here this evening to share my industry perspective. I'm also, I'm also a, 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 a uh, alumna. alumna. I've graduated I'm from the uh, uh, Science Health 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 Program in 2013. Yes, which is from, I used to work at VCU, which from what I remember is the number five uh, health administration program in the country. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Great program. Yes, congratulations. Uh, thank you to our panelists. So now we're, uh, we, we want to hear a little bit from you, especially as it relates to advocacy. So consider one of the following questions to respond to. What does advocacy mean to you? How do you address and or respond to the challenges that Black individuals face in healthcare settings? Or share your response to current events as it relates to advocacy for Black individuals in the healthcare medical field. Um, and Dr. Hines, we'd like to start with you. Okay, okay, so it's one. one. Yeah, just one. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, you know, right. well, <laughs> it's a, it's a, one one of a, a blend. <laughs> blend. 
Um, no, but I, I think that any conversation about advocacy, I, I think it's important for us to talk about what it is to start, but it's a, it's a really brief definition for me. Uh, advocacy is basically standing up for those who don't have a voice, you know, standing in, in the gap, uplifting and centering the voices of people who otherwise would not be heard. And so I do that and I address these challenges um, as a researcher through my work um, where I use community-based approaches to evaluate, you know, to bring those voices into the fold with regards to what we communicate to policymakers, to practice, to other researchers about what's happening in, in communities. And you know, it's really important to ensure that those community voices are being valued the same uh, to the same extent that you know a policymaker or a researcher or a researcher would. Um, and so I focus on, um, you know, just designing instruments and validating instruments that help to assess the patient experience, especially mistreatment and discrimination um, for Black folks. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I do. That's how I, I advocate through my research. That's awesome. And, you know, when you mentioned the mistreatment, you know, of Black individuals, that is probably, you know, the biggest issue um, that Black people face in the healthcare system. And that's this is why advocacy is needed so much. So thank you for working on that specific issue. Okay. Dr. Dr. Kidd, what about you? I, I think, I think um, uh, Dr. Hines mentioned this was wonderful. Um, and I think that the, like, you know, as we continue to try to bridge the ivory tower to our communities, it's really important that we have uh, researchers and practitioners such as Dr. Hines uh, doing some of the advocacy work. I, I, well, I could speak to what advocacy means to me and then a little bit, you know, it's going to touch on some other things. But when I started at Howard working on my master's in social work, that was the first time I heard this term, advocacy. And I always would think that it was like, uh, like if you wanted to be a therapist or if you wanted to go in child and family welfare, you know, you could go into advocacy. And I always, when I was young, I always connected it to policy for some weird reason, right? Because a lot of our classes when we were working on our social work degrees were centered around policy as well. But I look at advocacy in particular education, right? And making sure that we provide, uh, you know, uh, ways for people to digest heavy information, right? Just simply with telehealth, right? Something that I've been working with my, my clients to understand that they need to be on a HIPAA compliant portal and that they also, when they are, are doing payment for those of us who are paying, that they need to be on a HIPAA compliant or BAA compliant payment system. Just things like that. People didn't even, what's that? What's BAA? What's a BAA agreement? What is, a, what is HIPAA? What does these different things mean in regards to our privacy? And so a lot of times we do advocacy on a daily basis in regards to just increasing our consumers' capacity to understand their rights, but also understand how they can have a more pleasurable health experience. My, my vantage point is obviously is from behavioral health and mental health is a little different. But when we think about disparities and things like that in our community, particularly around this point, a lot of it is centered around not knowing their rights, right? Not knowing uh, what they have access to or what, what's put in place to protect them. So I think advocacy as a practitioner is empowering the client to not necessarily give them all the answers, but to provide them spaces so they can search for answers in a very digestible way. I can't go into uh, some of my clients and tell them, you know, yeah, you need to look up the HIPAA Act and things like that. They're gonna look at me like they got three heads. So I think it's really, like I have three heads. So it's really important right. that we meet the clients with that. And particularly for the black community was something that's really important, something that I've really been uh, uh, trying to push with a lot of my clients, with primarily, primarily my clientele is black, uh, is that to understand how these different things that we're going through in, in our country right now just exacerbate issues that we are going through currently, already going through, right? And so how COVID impacts other health disparities within our community. So I think those are so, some of that for me. I could talk forever, but I think that's those some of those things that sum it up for me in regards to advocacy. That's great. I mean, you know, definitely when you mentioned education, when you talked about knowing our rights, that's definitely something we're going to dive deeper into uh, very soon. So thank you for giving us that introduction. Um, Sharonica? Yes, um, this is a big question for me because I take it from two approaches. Um, one is their approach when I'm working in the field, uh, definitely from a hospital and managed care perspective, uh, holding those organizations accountable. Um, an example would be, uh, okay, we're using, we're using clinical practice guidelines. Uh, where were they drafted from? Who were at the table when they were made? How are they being implemented? Are they being implemented properly um, and effectively? Um, the other half that is really a big proponent that Dr. Kidd mentioned is about being educated, being edified. Um, I'm a big proponent of uh, informed consumerism. And we speak about this in other interest, industries, but we really don't speak about informed consumerism in healthcare. 
You know, you should be your biggest uh, stakeholder and advocate in your healthcare. And that means doing the research, asking the questions. Um, if something isn't clear, uh, you know, asking what, it, what, it, what does this mean? If we are on a care plan, uh, I want to know more about it. And I think that that comes from uh, with our history that we don't have a space or a place or the value to do such. Um, when you're asking your practitioner questions, it's not to challenge their expertise, but it's, it's uh, to increase your competency, really, so that you can be that stakeholder and the biggest advocate for your health. So definitely. Absolutely. And I actually have a question about that um, soon, but we're going to go into the um, actual panel discussion um, and I'll circle back to that. Um, so as we know, being informed um, is key in advocacy. We just kind of talked about that. So specifically, how can Black people become more informed about their rights as patients? And we'll start with uh, Dr. Hines. <laughs> Okay, so I, I think that Dr. Kidd already um, touched on a number of different points. Um, so I, I just want to uh, kind of underscore some of that. Now, now we know there are some, well, I don't know if most people know, but there are some general right, rights that are enforced by the federal law. You know, where you're talking about your access to your health records, your right to privacy and confidentiality, the fact that people aren't supposed to be talking about your medical information in terms that, you know, does not include you and that is not directly related to your care. And so there are rules that govern that. But I think what often services more often among um, Black patients within the context of our Black History Month is how do we deal with the mistreatment? So what happens when you're confronted with care that you find um, of not the best quality? And so that becomes very tricky, I believe. And, and so others who, who might have, um, you know, I would love to hear their comments as well. But I think that, you know, usually hospitals have processes by which you can file grievances and so on and so forth. But sometimes though, those processes are arduous and and involve a level of commitment and intent that most people aren't willing to follow through with. And so I think we end up in a situation in which the people who are disempowered, who are more likely to experience the poor quality of care are also in a position where they don't have the necessary resources or time, be it time or money or, or what have you to you know, go through those processes if they are mistreated. Right. So then you have this cycle of mistreatment that's happening, mistreatment on reporting, mistreatment on reporting. And so we're, we're in this you know, very um, difficult conundrum in which you know, the disempowered remain marginalized. Yeah. And so in order to do that, we really have to begin to address some of the structural issues within institutions and to, like, um, like Sharonica said, hold, hold institutions accountable for the care that they're giving, especially um, you know, to those groups that are considered underserved um, and that often uh, you know, kind of bear the burden of poor quality of care. Yeah, excellent. Any of our other panelists? Yes, I'd like to piggyback on what the Dr. Hines said in terms of just education, knowing the tools. But one thing that I want to bring to the forefront is knowing what does quality health care look like? recognizing when you have received healthcare that's subpar, so you can enact that chain of action. Um, I oftentimes when speaking with the community, they don't know what that looks like. They go to the doctor and they're just like, well, the doctor knows all, that's it. I would just follow this prescribed care plan without having like research or knowing that, okay, there are other options out there, or maybe this would have been a more a palliative uh, health, healthcare plan than what was prescribed to me. And I think that introducing those tools or those mechanisms, even if it's just understanding a basic level of medical terminology. If you have a care plan or a prognosis, go research it, Google it. If you don't understand it, go back and ask your practitioner to see what it is. And on the other side, for institutions, we are tasked as being healthcare leaders and innovators and thought leaders in the healthcare community. We are tasked with measuring healthcare. And that can be very obscure. Like how do, how do you measure healthcare? And one of the things that I press when I go to organizations are, well, yeah. uh, for example, uh, going to a health plan. If you have 75% uh, uh, Latino population, do you have enough practitioners that look like the population that you're serving? Do you have enough specialties to cover their, uh, their medical conditions? Have you done a population health survey and gap analysis to know who and, and the population you're serving? And these are tools that go from the corporate level that trickle down to the community. And so sometimes we have to go to the bottom of that pool and work upward so that the community also knows what quality healthcare looks like and what to expect. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. You know, oh, Dr. K, did you have something? 
I did want to say um, in regards to uh, just the behavioral health aspect of, uh, because, you know, when we go in, like, you know, to our primary care physician or urgent care and things like that, I think it's a different heightened, uh, you know, uh, approach to client care. And I think a lot of times because mental health or, you know, behavioral health or receiving mental health services can be so fluid in a lot of ways, um, I think that kind of falls by the wayside. A good resource that I try to, I try to give to my clients, uh, particularly just to kind of share with them what their rights are and how their actual therapeutic or clinical experience should go is the Mental Health, uh, mental health America has a really good, they have about four or five, um, I guess you could say code of ethics and the National Association of Social Workers call it code of ethics. Uh, but, but these are your rights, you know, patient rights as an individual who has been diagnosed with a mental diagnosis or substance abuse or both. Um, and they are really, really important. I will put the uh, link to them in the chat, but some of them are liberty and autonomy that just because you do have a clinical diagnosis, does this does not take away your ability uh, to make decisions about your life and the type of treatment, particularly around advanced care directors. I want to just speak on that as well. Of those of us who are, I lost my father maybe three years ago, it was a mess. I have five sisters. So it's six of us. It was a freaking mess, right? And the reason why I say that is because advanced care directors and things like that were not put in place, right? So when we got, when, you know, when my dad, when we found out when we were going to lose my dad, we were all kind of scrambling to kind of get things in place. Understanding your, and, and, and just doing estate planning and things like that for myself and my family, also just doing my own research, it's really important to understand that you have certain rights to die, right? Individuals in your family have certain rights to die in a dignified way. It's really important that you start to talk to for those of us, and, and we think about, and the research shows individuals that come from populations of color are less likely to lean on God and Jesus Christ to carry out their advanced care directives, which in theory is cool, but we live in very, a very much so secular world, right, with secular uh, uh, policies and procedures. So that's something I really wanted to kind of, when we think about healthcare, is also right. familiarizing yourself with that. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mr. Lewis, I know- No, no, you're doing a great uh, job, no problem. Uh, and uh, seclusion and restraint, all right, that you have the right to be, just because you have a clinical diagnosis or substance abuse uh, diagnosis that you are free from all type of abuse, all right, community inclusion, speaking to uh, Ms. Sharonica's point that your actual practitioner uh, actually looks like you, or, or if you prefer that, you know, that that individual has a shared experience with you. And there's a few other in here uh, and, and, and adequate access to service. So those are a few things I like to try to give my, I give my clients this in a PDF so they can chew on it, you know, that I want them to get better, but I also want them to become more knowledgeable as well. So. Absolutely. I mean, all three of you are dropping such amazing knowledge about how key education is. Um, and especially during a time where, you know, you, you, as a patient, you go to your doctor, you get maybe five, 10 minutes to ask them questions. Um, so really the rest of, you have to become your own doctor the, and your own educator. The rest of your time is, all right, you got what you needed at your doctor. Now you need to go and research the other things yourself and reach out to maybe some other professionals as well. So and thank you. I just wanted Rob. to add, I just wanted to add that, you know, similar to that website that Dr. Kidd, mm -hmm. um, other professional organizations or kind of affinity organizations, Heart Association, Kansas Society, also have you know similar kind of um, patient bills of rights that can um, help educate people with regards to what they should be asking mm -hmm. for various aspects of care. Um, awesome, thank you. Another thing I want to add, if I can, um, yeah. Mr. Lewis, it, it popped up when you were speaking about advanced directives and your rights, or what Dr. Hines mentioned that is that if you're receiving any care and that has informed consent, make sure you read through that literature. When you sign onto a new health plan and have member or patient rights, make sure you read through that information so that you know the playing field of that what is covered, what's not covered. You understand your managed care plan. And if you don't understand it, get help, get assistance to read through that material um, because it really is the construct of the care you will receive in your experience. Absolutely, thank you for that. We do have a question from the attendees. Um, this is for all of the panelists. How do you address a healthcare provider that does not value your opinion about procedures, medicine, et cetera, that you have researched? And I personally have definitely <laughs> experienced that. So how do you all address that? And I can hop, hop and speak to that. Um, one thing about assessing healthcare quality is having that practitioner patient experience. 
And these are often the gray areas, the intangibles that aren't measured. And a part of that is having communication that is able to be digested and understood. Uh, the second part of that is the empathy and the human nature of the practitioner understanding concern of their patient. And if it truly is a disjunct, um, I'm always an advocate of the power of a second opinion um, so that you can go to a, a practitioner of, of similar or same specialty and see how that, that interaction goes and what protocol or medicinal measures are offered and then make an informed decision. Um, I think having that sovereignty within yourself to have that option of a second opinion and to also bring that to the forefront in communication with your practitioner is very key. Um, while they are managing your healthcare, once again, you are the primary stakeholder and should be able to ask questions if things aren't clear or if there are things that are questionable to have those addressed in an appropriate manner. Absolutely, thank you. Other panelists? I just wanted to um, kind of reemphasize, and, and I think um, Ms. Barcliffe, in the last, um, under the last question, you talked about how um, you can um, sort of uh, recruit the the help of your family members, or, because you do need advocates. I saw kind of some comments flashing in the chat, and I thought also, you know, we come to this topic from a fairly informed, fairly privileged um, standpoint. We know how to use the internet. We know how to, how to advocate ourselves. The, the cultural generator where, you know, whatever the doctor said, you know, was, was what it was and you shouldn't argue with it. Um, you know, you, act, you know, kind of authoritative um, figure that the, that the physician or the clinician would look um, with that in mind, I think that it is an op there is an opportunity for people who are um, engaged, who are um, you know computer literate, health literate, all that other stuff, to to stand in the gap for our family members, particularly I think particularly older family members who may not be as savvy in, in many ways, and who may have some cultural attitudes towards their practitioners that perhaps this newer generation. Um, you know, does not have, like, we're more likely to ask questions or to stand up and say, well, I don't feel like I'm being treated fairly. Um, you, we have to, um, you know, even in our attempts to advocate, we have to be um, historically true to the fact that, you know, we are just one generation out of Jim Crow. And, um, you know, those processes and those mindsets are still alive and well. There were some people who work at segregated hospitals back in the day who are still you know, practicing even if they're just emeritus. And so those attitudes and, and, um, and perspectives still live on as do the perspectives of the patients um, who were subject to, to an unequal treatment, they also live on. Absolutely. absolutely. That was a great great back in high yes. yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kidd, did you have anything to add to that? No, oh. no, the, the superwoman took care of that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so now I want to uh, switch over to discussing student athletes. Um, as we know, student athletes have very different, unique healthcare needs um, than their peers due to their activity le level, whether it's different nutritional needs, injury control and prevention, just to name a couple. Um, then you throw in being a person of color um, that adds a whole lot of other needs as well. What strategies are recommended? for gaining a better understanding as to how Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, who are student athletes feel regarding healthcare being provided to them and whether or not it is equitable. This is, this is, um, this is this a, is a really, really tough, tough question. question. Uh, 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 systematic, systematic things that, uh, or systemic things that need to be addressed when we think about uh, strategies recommended for gaining a better understanding. I think the NCAA has to do a better job on recognizing if they want their athletes to have a better understanding. That's, that's the first thing. Um, and so we, we have that thought process moving forward of trying to understand, you know, that the NCAA is showing good faith in that. I think some strategies, uh, some that I've always suggested, I've worked with a few NCAA member institutions providing services to some of their athletes. And something I always talk about is the, for athletes to get better understanding is, is that they get more repetition, right? This isn't, you know, we can't be, you know, religious or, or repetitious in other things in our lives and not be repetitious with improving our mental health. It's funny, I had a consult today for a potential new client and they said they wanted to meet bi-weekly. 
And I told her, I said, well, if you want to lose, lose 50 pounds, you're not going to go to the gym bi-weekly, right? You're not right, going to go, right. you know, Monday and then I'm going to go on Thursday, right? And so we have to have the same type of approach. I think the NCAA and I think a lot of member institutions in NCAA approach uh, behavioral health as kind of a touch and go and as kind of like an auxiliary piece to their main program where it should be included as a main staple, just like study hall, just like nutrition, just like practice, just like travel, academics, things of that nature. So I think repetition, exposure is really important, right? The messenger behind the exposure is really important. We have a lot of white sports psychologists who hold a lot of mental health positions in most member institutions in NCAA. Let me tell you something. The reason why I'm hired is because black kids from DC that's playing on your college basketball team, they're not talking to the seven-year-old white guy um, who's a sports psychologist, right? right. It's right. as simple as that, right? I'm not, I don't, I don't, you know, I know some of y'all might be like, whoa, this is a lot, right? But this is, this is the reality of what, what's at play. So I think that the messenger behind having uh, skillful uh, practitioners who are culturally responsive and culturally representative uh, to the particular uh, population at hand. And this needs to be different, right? This, I think what NCAA uh, member institutions have done is kind of got one practitioner and it's a one size fit all, but I've worked with uh, clients and had students as a professor at a major division one Southeast, uh, Southeastern Conference school. I've had students that are from, uh, you know, the seashells and different places of that nature off the coast of Africa. You know, the, just because I'm a black male does not mean that I would be the best position to to serve that particular st student athlete. So it's important that a lot of NCAA uh, athletic departments adopt uh, three to four practitioners to provide services and to give student athletes an entree of uh, individuals to, to deal with and engage with so they can get their needs met. When you go on psychology today, you hit all of the different sorting and fi filter items. And I think student athletes are pigeonholed because they don't have that. Uh, so I think that's really important. The messenger is really important. When I was working as a young therapist, they always used to tell me, oh, well, black males don't go to therapy. Black people don't do therapy. I have 30 clients, 25 of them are black males, right? And yes. so it's not an issue of uh, gender or historical context and things like that. It's just simply putting somebody in front of them that they really feel comfortable with. And so those are, those are some, some things as well. Boot camps are important. There should be off season boot camps should be you know important in regards to how complex mental health is and how it looks different and, and how behavioral health I hear mental health a lot but behavioral health right your mental and emotional well being and how it's connected to negative coping mechanisms such as substance use such as for some of, you know for me as a, as a ex football college football player kind of how it's like how we use objectifying women and hypersexuality as a way to cope with insecurities of, 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 of who we were. And so all of these things can be addressed if we're putting in time, money, and all of these other things into the cultivation of, of our student athletes. This cannot be moved to the periphery and not included. So I'm gonna shut up and let the people talk. That was excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Other panelists? Uh, I think he just, uh, I believe he covered the, the laying ground of that one. So I'll, I'll, I'll walk light because he got it. But I do want to um, kind of delve on the idea of having mentorship and uh, that agency of having companies come in, not companies, but practitioners and former athletes that look like the athletes are playing to develop them on and off the field, you know, because we're looking about, you know, not just health and well being, but just in totality health, how we have so many things that. Uh, they are tackled with, and especially with COVID-19 and sports and athletics, their future um, to be developed and to be discussed. And if you have, like Dr. Kidd said, that entree of practitioners or that agency of mentorship or companies are coming to do boot camps, that advocacy, someone that looks like them, someone that employs the idea that therapy and discussing behavioral health is normal and healthy, uh, continues to have that, that edification and, and push that needle forward in terms of behavioral health in full development, not just as an athlete, but as a, a person, a human um, in progressive health, so. And, and something else, just to kind of yeah. piggyback, I gave a, the, uh, the engagement with parents is really important, particularly for, I can't speak for anybody, uh, any other community, I'm black and, and I'm not a person of color, uh, any of that, I am black and I live from a very black experience. Right, and what I know in the black community is that we have some intergenerational issues, some intergenerational dysfunction 
around healthy emotional and mental well-being. And so it was really important that uh, that, we, that, that there is some engagement. If you're recruiting a kid, that these parents should have some engagement as well in regards to a holistic wellness model approach to your student athlete, typically going to some division one college that is culturally distant. And even now more, I'm speaking with Arizona State last week and PBS in Arizona a couple of weeks ago about this same issue. Even now, even in the pandemic, it makes, it highlights this even more, exacerbates this even more because I'm trying to cope on a campus that necessarily doesn't have my innate uh, coping, you know, opportunities, things that I will actually just gravitate, gravitate to as a black basketball player, whatever the case may be. So College Basketball Players Association is a new organization that I gave a talk to a couple, about a month ago. Um, and I was primarily working with uh, big time division one college basketball players and their families on understanding some of, I call it demystifying the stigma of mental health. And that was a really powerful thing that the College Basketball Players Association put on for those parents. And it was questions below. So I think the parents are a big key as well. Awesome, thank you very much. I just want to add a tidbit. Yeah. I mean, already preached and already saying, so we're just passing the plate. But I wanted to say that um, as it pertains to the college athletes, um, I'm, I'm so glad that we had, you know, uh, Dr. Kidd on with his expertise as a former student athlete, but you know, it's also student um, athletes that that period of young adulthood is very important with regards to behavioral change and for building healthy habits moving forward. So, in thinking about holistic health and thinking about the health of, of, of athletes, especially consider when you when look, you look at, at you know professional leagues um, and the fact that there are disparities, racial and ethnic disparities, and pain and um, and you know, physical functioning and all sorts of measures, um, likely as a result of the things they did with their bodies when they were younger people. Um, you know, I think it's really important to emphasize prevention, even among young athletes, proper nutrition, you know, you know, doing all the things, you know, building weight, building, getting the gains the, the, the right way, because all those things have implications for your future health, particularly your cardiovascular health. Absolutely. But again, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, we have to we have to work on this from a systemic level, you know, we you know, in order to implement the things Dr. Hines, you just said, as well as Dr. Kidd. Um, one of the things that I also heard in there that really, you know, you know, rings with me is um, seeing people seeing professionals that look like you, you know, seeing doctors and, and nurses and other mental health professionals that look like you. I think we also really need to put a lot of work into cultivating the next generation of black and, and minority healthcare professionals. We need to put a lot of money, a lot of time and energy into that as well. So awesome. Um, I did want to get to one more question because I think this is really important as it relates to advocacy, um, you know, before we go into the rest of the Q&A. Um, but Black people who are incarcerated also have unique health care needs. Um, this, I'm really passionate about this. What does health care advocacy look like for this group? You know, I'll take a stab at this one because it really resonates. Um, when we address healthcare of the incarcerated, we are even moving beyond the social determinants of health and starting to look at the structural determinants of health in, in that systemic nature. And one thing that a lot of uh, those who are incarcerated don't know that you have an Eighth Amendment. And I start with the Eighth Amendment and trickle down into how we can advocate for such. The amendment is for to protect against cruel and unusual punishment. And that includes healthcare. And that also includes um, any deliberate act to prevent an inmate from receiving adequate care. And I'm a wordsmither, so I hone in on the word adequate. What does that mean? And so now we start to go into, okay, does that, what is the baseline? And who says what that baseline is for the incarcerated? And I think that that point of advocacy is very imperative so that they understand, okay, we're looking for things that are medically necessary, which are very key terms in the healthcare industry. And when you map down medically necessary, what does that mean in terms of your care? How, in terms of the type of care, how you get it and who gives it to you? Um, and a lot of folks don't know, but there are standards and guidelines that uh, correctional facilities have. They have the National Commission of Correctional Healthcare um, that issues guidelines and standards. And these are baseline. And I'm a big advocate of knowing, knowing the field that you're playing on. 
uh, playing chess. So that way they can say, hey, I have this condition going on. I've said several times I'm experiencing back pain, lower back pain. I believe that it may be um, a kidney issue. They are supposed to service that issue in terms of getting that practitioner in that specialty to help that particular individual. And I think that once we start to really push, you still have a right to great and quality health care, even though you are incarcerated. It does not take away that right Human healthcare is a human right. <laughs> and just, just important that that value, value is really important. important. Because I think that sometimes when they, they enter into this system, system um, um, the paradigm, the paradigm is that they're less, less like, they don't deserve health care. You know, just stay in here, rot and die. And that's not the messaging that that's true. So and this is why working on this issue from a systemic level, like you all discussed earlier, is so important because we need those key people in there to help educate you know, people who are incarcerated to understand their rights. Otherwise, you know, they're just, you know, they have to figure it out themselves or, and, and continue to be mistreated. Right, so, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, I just want to say great. one little point. Um, be, given the high rates of um, mental illness um, with and among the incarcerated, in fact, you know, kind of mental illness that preceded the incarceration and the, the entanglement of mental illness and, you know, criminality, you know, is an issue that we definitely have to, to, to approach from a systemic perspective. Um, and, you know, I don't have all the answers for that now, but I'm sure my colleagues might have some additional comment on, on how we can um, move forward with regards to trying get um, incarcerated individuals proper mental health care and true rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think I think the, the big challenge here, here in DC, it's a big issue. You know, you commit a crime here in DC, it's a federal crime. You're not going down the street, you're going to Kentucky. I have a nephew that is incarcerated for murder. I, I can't see him because he's so far away. Um, and so what DC has done, has done a great job from a government standpoint to, you know, uh, from a procurement standpoint to provide a lot of opportunities for contracts, uh, for service providers to provide uh, services around, you know, overall health to formerly incarcerated or people or, re or members of the re-entry population um, and to try to curb recidivism. In regards to health, something that, that is really, really important, I can't speak to uh, the physical component because that's just not my been my exposure but i worked with incarcerated individuals for about four years and a big issue with uh like 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 dr hines mentioned is the trauma that comes you know that comes from it so a lot of things what people do is go to their constituents and their different council uh members and representation here in dc and they advocate for more you know increased programming things like that what has not been advocated well it may have been advocated but has not been increased is actual housing so everybody wants to, you know, give them a couple of dollars to get a job and get, you know, get some new clothes and things like that. But no one wants guys living in their neighborhood. And that is a real big issue. So I think right now when we talk about health, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Sharonica mentioned, um, you know, social determinants of health, structural determinants of health. One thing that from a therapeutic standpoint, the mass, basic Maslow hierarchy needs we really need to advocate for individuals to have adequate housing. They cannot make it, they can't, they cannot, not just out of 10 return to where they come from because they committed the offense. Somebody at their, at, in their general living arrangement may be on government assistance. They then have potentially a forfeiture if they are caught living there. So it's a lot of things in our country that kind of impede or erode the ability for us to improve wellness with this particular population. It's a big reason why I may be thinning a little bit, trying to talk to different individuals in the city to try to improve the lived experience, particularly around health and particularly around basic rights uh, for these individuals. Well, I see a lot of traction though is when people put uh, pressure on the council members here. And um, it has been really, really beneficial. And DC has already been kind of pro progressive, even though I don't think as progressive enough, but they have been progressive uh, in other jurisdictions than my time back in South Carolina, where someone who may be incarcerated and they come home and, and, and return home, they may not have the same type of uh, uh, opportunities. But I've helped guys have come home with multiple felonies and then they go on and make six figures. Um, and I always say only in DC, but housing is always an issue, right? 
housing is always an issue for individuals to get out. And particularly in D.C., where we're seeing the only halfway house that was accepting guys to come back into D.C. was shut down mid-pandemic. All right, guys, mid-pandemic. Yeah. And those individuals have to go live in Baltimore. And some of you all who are not familiar with the uh, geographic piece, you may think, oh, well, Baltimore is only 45 minutes, 50 minutes from D.C. People from D.C. do not like people from Baltimore. It is totally different. All right. It is a totally, totally different. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just kind of highlight some of that. <laughs> Thank That's you for that. I had no idea of that. Um, uh, so now I want to give some time for the uh, attendees to ask some questions. Um, so feel free to, again, use the chat um, and we'll, uh, you know, do our best to answer your questions. Um, and to have one question uh, for our panelists um, as our attendees are typing up their questions. Um, nutrition education. Um, at, you know, we're, we're talking about Black people, the Black community, and healthcare. One of our biggest issues, the Black community in healthcare, is chronic disease. And a lot of chronic disease, as we know as professionals, um, preventable, sometimes reversible. We don't get a whole lot of education on the lifestyle management things, such as nutrition, exercise, things like that. How can we be, how can we introduce that more to the Black community and advocate for it more for the Black community? <laughs> I was going to say, so, um, you know, before I lived in Richmond, I actually lived in Baltimore. And so I had some projects looking at um, the food environment um, you know, from the perspectives of Baltimore residents. And so a lot of times we emphasize, oh, black people have poor diets. Oh, it's cultural. Oh, they're used to the fat back and the collard greens and that's why they won't know. But in actuality, we know that there are, again, structural features in play. We know that black neighborhoods are inundated with, uh, with you know, liquor stores, convenience stores with no supermarkets. There are effectively food deserts, meaning there is no healthy food as well as food swamps, mean, meaning that there is a concentration of poor food. And so you just imagine putting an individual dead smack in a place where there's no supermarket, nowhere where you can get fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables. You might be able to get a few at a, at a premium at the convenience store and tell them, oh, you should be eating mostly fresh fruits and vegetables and you know, lean meats. And there's nowhere to find them. So they have to take you know, multiple buses to get across town you know, in Baltimore, in, is East Baltimore, West Baltimore, the, the, never, the world, never shall the two meet. There are two different worlds, even within a city. So you, go, you want them to go all the way to the east side, to a market, and then, you know, they're riding public transportation. They have multiple bags, so they're limited on the, on the number of bags that they, they can take, because remember, they're going to bring them back with them on public transportation. So maybe they have two bags worth of food that they can bring back for their full family. So how many times do they have to take that trip? Um, in order to bring back those foods during the week and you want it to be fresh. Now, granted, we have been teaching people better about, oh, you can get frozen, frozen goods. You can get, you know, canned goods, assuming that they had have a, adequate equipment in their homes, a, a refrigerator and a stove that works that they can use to prepare the food. And, you know, so there are a number of different challenges um, that go into play when people are making, the, you know, are, are performing these health behaviors that we see. These decisions are made based on the options that they feel are presented to them. And oftentimes we are, we are making it hard for people to do the right thing and much, much easier for them to do the wrong thing. And so I think we have to contextualize behaviors to broader systemic issues in the broader context of the environment. You hit that a home run on that one, Dr. Hines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other um, comments on that? I mean, Dr. Hines, you, you, again, you did an excellent job with that. So we'll move forward. <laughs> so here's another question from uh, our audience. Uh, what are the signs to look for if you suspect your healthcare is being driven by profits versus what's in your best healthcare interests? For example, procedures being ordered that are not needed. This is a good one. Mm, I'll hop right in on this one. Um, <laughs> There are a few key indicators. Um, a lot of times we have assessments in terms of uh, timeliness to get an appointment, um, how much time your practitioner is spending with you to go over uh, your care plan, um, dialing in on are they really going into detail about your care plan. Uh, one thing in terms of an active example is a practitioner that automatically recommends surgical uh, methods instead of um, managing your care or other options. Um, that's a key indicator. Um, I would 
would advise to ask more about whether well, are there other options other than a surgical method to reach uh, good healthcare status or to reach the goal that we have. Um, there are several measures to look at and you can ask, uh, you can look, you have visually go into your facility or your doctor's office and see, are they maintaining the, uh, the premises? Is it wheelchair accessible? Are they putting money to make sure that all people can access the premises? Um, when you call in, are you able to get an appointment or is it overbooked? Like these are sometimes indirect signs. If you can't get an appointment with your doctor within a certain amount of time frame, then oftentimes they're putting too many patients, like operationally, they're putting too many patients in a certain amount of time frame. They're not spending enough time with each one. Um, that's why I advocate for value-based quality care versus revenue-based cycles. Um, there's some, some, you know, writings on the wall that will give you some indication that uh, you're not receiving value-based care versus uh, revenue-driven. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah. Any other comments? Give me the question again, Mr. Lewis. Sure. So, what are the signs to look for if you if you suspect your healthcare is being driven by profits versus what's in your best interest? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, this is something that I, I, I always like to, particularly in mental health. This this type of abuse comes up with the Medicaid Medicare population. Right. And you have core service agencies that just want your Medicaid number. Right. And they want you. So if you have somebody in your family as a Medicaid recipient, they want your number so they could bill your number for all these plethora of services that you're not going to get. And this happens a lot. Right. Typically, you have an agency structure and then they provide you mental health therapy, community support work. Uh, something I'm seeing a lot of now, particularly in Central Virginia, is life skill, something like a life skills counselor position. So I'm seeing that happen in that area. Uh, some places uh, have where you could go and get your prescriptions filled. Not a lot of places, right? But some have that. All those things fall up under, right? Could fall up under one provider. That provider is billing your Medicaid number for all of those services. Something that I see, I have a small subset of my clientele that are Medicaid recipients. Something that I see is that they experience a lot of abuse because they do not receive adequate care, right? They just kind of, they just in a meal, right? So if you have somebody that is in your family, if that's you or if that's been an experience for you in your family in regards to having that unpleasurable experience, make sure you do research in your area about who are good providers. Now, sometimes providers are great providers and they just hire horrible people, right? And so if that's the case, then you may want to talk to your provider and say, hey, look, you know, this hasn't been working all that well. Is it anybody else that you may suggest, right, for me to provide services for or whatever the case may be? You can always file a complaint, things like that. But when we think about inadequate services, right, a lot of times this impacts our Medicaid recipients who are what? Uh, underserved, typically come from our underserved communities, right? Or underloved communities. They come from those, those spaces. So when we think about that, if you get a little, a little smell, a little stench that something is not right, and what you're going to do, what you're going to do is you can always ask for, as a, as a, as a patient, as a consumer, you could always ask for your file. And you could run that, you could look at your file and say, well, they didn't see me on March 16th, not at 2021 at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? I didn't receive that service there, right? So when you think about, when we think about this, this typically doesn't happen for those of us who have insurance through private insurance, right? But Medicaid recipients, this is something that really, really, really impacts them. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to hope I answered the question. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh... I think, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Lewis. No, yeah, you go ahead. When you, uh, Dr. Kidd, were speaking about uh, the billing, that rang a bell with an example that I actually saw um, with a mother bringing her child in for a well visit. And typically, um, insurance well visits are covered. And um, they had a sign in front of the office that says anything discussed outside of the well visit would have an additional CPT code added to it. Uh, one, most folks don't know what a CPT code is <laughs> uh, in terms of billing, but what happened in this particular instance, which I was advocating for, the practitioner asked a question 
that prompted the question that was outside of the well visit and then subsequently build uh, their insurance. Um, and of course, if you ask the question, they didn't, it, they didn't preface the question as a parent or the child and they were billed. They were billed for extra services, uh, upwards of $350 for that particular visit because technically there was a discussion that was had that was outside of the general well visit. So that does happen. I wanted to, that I thought about it when Dr. Kidd mentioned that it does happen a lot, especially in, in Medicaid for sure. Absolutely, thank you. Um, what about uh, COVID-19? You know, obviously we, we, we can't end this discussion without talking a little bit about that. What are some challenges, um, you know, that the Black community faces um, as it relates to this change in our environment? Everything's virtual. Even your doctor's appointments oftentimes are, are uh, virtual. Um, what are some challenges that Black people are facing because of this change and how can we better advocate for our health in this virtual medical world as well? Um, I guess I could pop it off. I think it's, that's such a loaded question, Mr. Lewis. I mean, golly. Um, I think some, yeah. some challenges that we are really, really facing, and not so much because it seems like since Joe Biden was elected president, it's like a lot of this stuff that we're dealing with is kind of subsided, right? And that's the issue with our society is that we, these things still exist. The hegemony and challenges that we face as a society still exist, and the challenges that black people face in the society still exist. They didn't go away, right? And so uh, with that, the racial trauma is going to continue, right? And so when we think about uh, from a, a racial standpoint, right, from a racial identity standpoint, COVID has really, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, exacerbated the disparities that were already there, right? Okay, now I'm working from home or now I'm staying from home. I can't go, for, particularly for individuals in DC, I can't go down the street on 7th Street and go to CHOP but I'm where I live at and now I got to go down the street and go to McDonald's, right? And so when we think about just from a food standpoint, right, that's, that's one thing, right? But the racial trauma around, centered around what's been going on in, this, in, in conjunction with COVID-19 mm -hmm. is something that we're going to continue to deal with because of the disparity, right? Because of the racial disparity, right? That's what really the disparity in healthcare, uh, particularly around COVID. I'll give you an example, Prince George's County, Maryland is probably one of the richest, at one point it was the richest county, black county in America or black county in Maryland, it's, it's up there. They are having issues with rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine. So if you're saying that the most privileged black county is having challenges with the rollout of COVID-19, not necessarily saying people don't wanna get it, but not having the vaccine readily accessible, just imagine what uh, some of our other underloved communities in the region are going through, right? We've ran into a situation here with individuals from a neighboring county came over to Prince George's County and monopolized the early vaccination times and appointments, right? And so when we think about it, it's, it's really, the racial trauma is really important. Information around vaccines and making people feel comfortable about taking the vaccines. My mom's not taking the vaccine. I'm taking the vaccine. Right, it's a general, it's a generational divide and generational gap. As you, as you can see, my mom being 35, 40 years older than me, and so that's an issue, right? And some other barriers as well is that COVID nineteen. This is the thing has all it's just made co other comorbidities even worse. So when we have individuals who may be going for dialysis treatment, when we have individuals that have to engage. Uh, here in the DC, PG County, the Kaiser Permanente is really, so you got to go into Kaiser Permanente to do a lot of some of the stuff that you have to do, right, or going to these care facilities. We are now exposing ourselves already when we may be more at high risk for uh, heart issues, diabetes, high blood pressure, all of these different things facilitate COVID-19 as well, right? So we have some disparities in regards to the health. So those are a few things that make COVID-19 just even more challenging right and 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 even more it, like i said it just exacerbates uh the challenges even more from a mental health standpoint uh, what i have been seeing with COVID 19 and how it's impacted the black community in a lot of ways is actually in a good way right people are therapy's now been their only outlet and so now they're interested to say hey look well can i get you know can i have a session here can i can my kids see you whatever the case may be and having some constructive in this time has been really 
really beneficial. And I know that not just speaking from my experience, but from a lot of my colleagues. I mean, we at one point I was I was gassed out, right? And so I've seen it, you know, sometimes we focus on the adverse issues that, but also there's some beauty in this atrocity that's been going on in our country that we are starting to recognize that certain things that we did not do before really are important and should be holding a space on our daily, weekly, and monthly routines and our lives, right, around wellness, okay? So those are a few things that I, I've been seeing. Thank you very much, Dr. Kidd. We are running out of time. Um, so I, for in one minute um, for our panelists, what would you like to leave uh, the attendees with? I'll hop in. Um, if there were words that I would give is that our lives are valuable. Um, encourage dialogue with your loved ones so that you have not only that clinical assistance, but the experiential assistance to share and care, especially uh, with folks that look like you, that love you and want to see you win. Um, if there's any underlying message that we've seen tonight is that advocacy is key, edification is key, ask questions, be informed. Um, there is quality in life for black and brown people and we deserve it, you know, we truly deserve it. Absolutely. Anything else? Uh, I'll just jump in and just remind everybody a key takeaway for tonight, guys, to create some space uh, to replenish, right? Um, something that I'm working with a lot of my clients right now is their self-care game plan and also trying to get them to understand uh, their healthy approaches to self-care. Self-care is key and it should be a preventative measure, right? And self-care is something that we, it has to be intentional. We don't, we, we think, oh, well, I'm chilling watching my favorite movie because I just happen to be on the couch. That self-care is something that we need to plan for and something that we need to institute in our weekly schedules. So I want to, I want to leave you all with that. And I also want to leave you all with this, create some grace to be human. Right, something that I've been trying to remind a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic, it was just like, we gonna, everybody gonna switch over to virtual life and everything's gonna be okay. And it got into this real, real really weird space of productivity shame. Oh, if you're not grinding now, then you never gonna grind. You're never gonna be successful, right? And that's a very unhealthy message. Take some time to understand that, hey, I've been doing this for a year now, a year and two weeks, guys. We've been doing this for a year and two weeks, uh, two weeks, four years. I am tired today. I am I am fatigued. You, we give over excess. I was listening, uh, reading an article. We give over excess of, I think, a billion dollars in PTO back to our employers every year. The American workforce. Use your leave. Take some time for yourself. Carve out some time, even if it's just to sit on the couch, and eat your favorite uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So I will want to leave you all with that. Make sure you institute little space and grace to be human. We're very right. upset. Dr. Those Hines. were great. Yeah, I'll just echo. It's been my pleasure to share this space with you all. Um, I'll echo what the panel, other panelists have already said. I just wanted to remind everyone that health equity is not a black issue. It's not a white issue. It's everybody's issue. Um, equity is everybody's business. And if the pandemic hasn't taught us anything else, it is that you know if if our fellow man is affected then we will eventually at some point also be affected. And so you, we should be proactive in taking care of ourselves as well as taking care of each other. And that's all I had. Michelle. Thank you so much. Everyone, let's give a round of applause, whether it's the Zoom round of applause with the reactions or your own uh, motion. This was excellent. Um, these are experts. This was a master class. Thank you all so much uh, for your expertise. Um, and I just want to leave you all with um, a simple statement, which is if, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. So be sure to be an advocate for yourself. Again, like I said earlier, you got to be your own doctor. Be an advocate for your family, for your friends, and your other peers. All you have is your health at the end of the day. Thank you all very much. Um, don't forget to fill out the survey um, that the hosts um, put in the chat. And um, thank you again to the Office of Multicultural Affairs and student athletes. All right, thank you all. Have a good night.